Varmt välkomna som sagt till den här konferensen, heldagskonferensen. Jag har nu den äran att inleda med den första, de första gästerna alldeles strax. Och nu ska jag bara klicka ner. Och det är ju så att föreningen Nordfront sedan ett antal år tillbaks delar ut ett pris, ett demokratipris. Som går till personer eller det kan också vara organisationer som har agerat på ett sätt som stärker demokratin eller betydelsen av alla människors lika värde. Det, har, det brukar oftast gå till människor som jobbar i Sverige. Det är så att det är beskrivet i villkoren. Då och då gör vi dock undantag för det här. Det har hänt en gång tidigare. Och det var 2014 då eh, styrelsen för ordförande bestämde jag ett undantag och ge priset till Edward Snowden. I år och i fjol egentligen så har vi gjort ytterligare ett sådant undantag. <hör> och kommer därför i år att, att ge, även för i år, att ge priset till Sean Binder och Sara Maldini. Eh, och jag kommer nu läsa upp vår eh, motivering till det och det läser jag på svenska. Strax efter det kommer jag att återgå till, eller övergå till engelska och prata med Sara och eh, Sean. Eh, jag ser att Sean är med oss. Jag hoppas att eh, eh, Sara också är på gång. Eh, annars så börjar vi samtalet med Sean tills Sara kan hoppa in. Jag ska säga också då att vi har gjort en liten film eh, med Sara och Sean som ni också kommer att se i efterhand där vi, eh, de berättar ytterligare lite mer om sitt arbete. Sara och Sean får i alla fall priset för att de har synliggjort den dödliga och skamliga tragedin i Medelhavet där 20 000 människor har drunknat sedan 2014 och den humanitära katastrof som råder i flyktingläger som Moria och nu Karatepe på Lesbos. Sara är själv flykting från Syrien, långdistanssimmare, professionell sådan. Hon anlände 2015 till ön tillsammans med sin syster på flykt från Syrien. Några mil utanför Lesbos började den gummibåt de färdade sig sjunka och systrarna valde att hoppa ner i havet och tillsammans med ytterligare ett par flyktingar simmande dra båten i land. De räddade eh, omedelbart där alltså 20 människoliv. Något år senare när Sara fått uppehållstillstånd i Tyskland valde hon att återvända som volontär för att bistå i de sök- och räddningsinsatser som anordnats av frivilligorganisationen Erki, den grekisk. Sean Binder, student och utbildad räddningsdykare, fattade ett moraliskt beslut att bistå de civila räddningsinsatserna när han såg hur EU-staterna valde att skala ner och ta bort livräddningsinsatser istället för att hjälpa människor från att drunkna. Hösten 2018 greps de var för sig av grekisk polis och frihetsberövades i över tre månader. Anklagade då för allvarliga brott som spionage och människosmuggling. Endast på grund av sitt deltagande i de här livräddningsinsatserna. De riskerar nu att dömas till över 20 års fängelse om, åtalen, om det väcks åtal och de döms. Eh, Sean och Sara är två av många aktivister runt om i världen som hotas av åtal och domar för sitt humanitära arbete. Genom att tilldela Sean Binder och Sara Mardini i demokratipriset så vill Ortrond upprepa sitt krav på säkra vägar till Europa och tydligt säga att rädda liv kan aldrig vara ett brott. Så, so, Sean, <laughs> I hope you're with us. Hopefully. I am indeed. Hi. Hi. Very welcome to, to all of the, uh, the, other, uh, the others. I've just read the um, uh, sort of the uh, reasons why you and Sarah got uh, our democracy prize. And Sarah is here as well. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you. Good morning. It's an early morning for all of us, I know. Um, yes, um, I would like to, for starters, uh, that you perhaps say a few words about yourself uh, and um, the reasons why you decided to um, go to Lesbos and help out in rescue and search mi missions. Sure. Do you want to go first, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, hey, um, thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Um, my name is Sean Binder. I'm um, 26 years old, um, and I, yeah, I think as was mentioned, I I was a student before I went to volunteer, and I was a student of European Defence and Security Policy, and that's when I realised that the European Union's response to one of the most severe humanitarian crises to befall the continent 
has been to effectively shut out and abandon those people who are most in need. And because I had a background in search and rescue, I grew up on the Irish coast. Um, I thought I had some of the skills that could go, that could be useful. And that's why I went to volunteer. And indeed, that's what I did for about a year. I was coordinating the search and rescue, um, one of the primary entry points, as was, as was mentioned already. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Mardini. I'm 25 years old. Um, a refugee, of course, living in Berlin. Um, and right now I am uh, working for an organization called Give Something Back to Berlin. And in, um, why I went back to that was because I've done the journey myself back in 2015. And I just realized that I can give a lot because I'm a social rescue swimmer and I can speak Arabic and English fluently. So I just didn't want anyone to go through the same that I went through. So that's basically why I went back to Lesbos. We talked a little bit about the other day about uh, what you were expecting um, what, uh, when you arrived to Lesbos. Sean, can you tell us a little bit about what your expectations were, if they actually uh, were fulfilled or if there was something different? How was, how was your experience uh, coming to Lesbos? I think, I think I was very naive when I came. I, I had, I, as I said, I had this policy bracket and I thought I knew about the context. But I had no idea the, I think the both the personal aspect of it, the the immense suffering experienced um, on the island, that I had no ability to to help out in, and um, and that's when I realized that I was also an experience with the policy side of things, how how structural these policies are, how it's not incidental that these crossings are so dangerous. It's it's part of it's part of that logic. It's part of the system that we've built into how we control European borders. For example, the Mediterranean is the deadliest sea in the world today. Uh, 19,000 people have perished in it in trying to reach uh, European waters for safety because they're fleeing war and conflict. Um, and I, th I think what's, what surprised me most was, was that, that this this policy is 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 really is really so so damaging, and so few people or so little effort is made into into changing, or, or so little effective policy has been has been made to try and overcome this. We have, for example, a new migration pact in the European Union that effectively recycles the same logic that we had in the past few years, and it's it's been so disheartening to to see that and to to not not to to know how to affect some kind of change. So I think. Whether, whether whether my expectations were, were realized or if I felt I could be very helpful, the answer unfortunately was, was no, it only very much at the margin. And while I think that's very important, it, there's nothing wrong with handing out blankets. I think oftentimes we have this view that search and rescue is this hugely dramatic experience where you go out in your motorboats and you pull people from the water. In fact, most of the time, despite the deadliness of the sea, the people who make it across do so because they are survivors, not because we have been this amazing savior force. Most of the time I handed out blankets to people or gave them a smile. But in a context where the policy is so severe and we abandon people to drown, then even that smile is important. So it was the little things, it was the things that you never expected to make a difference, make a big difference in a context as deadly and as dangerous as European border control. That was quite surprising, I thought. And, and for you, Sarah, was it a, a difficult decision to return to to Lesbos? And um, how how was your what was your reactions when you returned to the island? Um, had it changed, and and um, under what circumstances are people living there, or there were at least the two years ago, and um, when you arrived, or when you arrived, when you came came back. Um, no, it wasn't difficult to go back there because I, I know what was there because I saw it before and that's why I went back. So, of course, because I was, I was prepared for, for uh, the bad situations that they had uh, because maybe I lived way worse than that. Um, 
But unfortunately, yeah, after I came back after one year, um, there was um, actually in some point it was better that there was more organizations. There was more advocacy into what was going on because we were talking about 2015 and then 16. So there was enough, there was a whole different perspective from volunteers and activists and 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 yeah, like there was literally people on the shoreline waiting for for refugees and doing sea rescue and everything. But if you want to look into the camps and if, into the policies and into lesbos in general, um, no, nothing changed. It was completely the same. Uh, and I think mostly people operated as it's an um, emergency situation that will go away in a couple months. Um, and in the camps, yeah, nothing changed. The conditions is, I think everybody's pretty aware about the conditions and if they are not, they should actually Google it and be aware because it says it's, a, it's yes, it's super far from us, but it's happening and it's real. And we all should be part of it because it's, uh, it's literally we're entering the now sixth and seventh year of uh, not migration crisis, European crisis through migration to to migration. Um, and I think everybody should be involved or at least have a bit of knowledge about what's going on. Um, so basically, um, more refugee camp when it was existing, there was um, there was literally like people lives in ISO boxes, and I who doesn't know what is ISO box is that shipping containers that we like just transfer things from a country to another with, with windows and door. Um, and it's out of metal. So people actually live uh, in a box made out of metal in the winter and in the summer. And I don't need to explain how the situation feels there. Um, and usually it fits for like, if there's a family, it fits for like five to six. Um, but of course in Moria there's, you have multiple families and over like 10 or 12 people living in the same um, container because there is no space. Um, there is very inhumane hygiene conditions. Um, some organization and when we existed, we worked on um, healthcare and mental health as much as we can. We, we were in some point able to see 100 and 150 patients a day but we do not exist since two years now. Um, and there is other organizations, but you know, when we spoke about uh, um, the organization are filling up the gaps of the government. And then the moment that you have one organization leaving, you're actually missing a lot. Um, so, and it was bad before we came, it's bad when we were there and it's still even worse now because Moria do not exist and they build a camp on the sea level uh um one and a half month ago and then the first storm basically in Lesbos the camp floated um and people literally sleeping on the ground on the tents um there is no hygiene there's no privacy there is no human rights in all kind of kinds women men children even animals literally there's nothing um there's no education if there is some it's provided by other organizations but it's like not the education that actually make kids, make children or anyone else like actually grow and, and focus a bit about themselves. Um, food situation, people line up for hours and hours and hours. And um, in a, in Moria, they used to have this like, I'm not even gonna go to a cell. It's like a like very long cell that people go and line up inside it. And literally it's all like, um, it's all uh, fence. It's just like a squared fence that you go inside and line up with other people. Um, and when I saw it the first time, I literally cried because I, it's just so traumatic and, and it's so literally inhumane. Um, water, there was running water, but a lot of people didn't really want to drink it because they said, thought it's like super dirty and it's not healthy, which I do not blame them because like when you live in this type of refugee camp, so I don't know what you expect. But then the uh, camp was giving, um, gives I think one or two only, one liter water bottles for every uh, every one person. So yeah, this is Moria camp in detail. So. I, I hope I gave enough um, information about it. 
uh, can you tell us a little bit about what um, your tasks were uh, while you were there working? Yeah, you can go, uh, you can go Sean. Yeah, sure. Um, so the organization that we both volunteered for had three main branches. Um, so it, it began as a search and rescue organization. And then it had something called site management support. And we also ran a clinic, a clinic that Sarah already mentioned in Moria Camp, which was actually one of the, for a time, the only daytime clinic that was running within the within the camp proper. Again, you should note that that's a civilian organization, not a, not a state organization. Um, my task was in search and rescue. I am a rescue diver. I have a boat license. I've done search and rescue training, and that's why I joined the team. And I began coordinating that search and rescue for that organization um, for about a year, beginning 2018 or the end of 2017. And that effectively meant making sure that we were able to respond and could respond with our two um, ribs, which are essentially those those speedboats with the with the tubing on the outside. And we had two of those. We had a search and rescue team and a medical team with which that we which would, we could respond to emergencies both at land and at sea. And so my responsibility was to make sure that the team was continuously trained, that our equipment was in order, and that if there was a boat landing or emergency that we responded. And it was my job to liaise with the authorities, like the Coast Guard and the police, ironically, of course, with hindsight. And Sarah? Is that, were um, your tasks similar or different? Uh, similar but different at the same time. Um, I was doing social rescue with Sean as well. And I was doing Arabic translating, which Sean can do. And, and uh, what else I was doing? <laughs> That's like two years ago. Like Sarah did more. basically everything. Um, no, I... So I didn't really do everything, but the thing is that I was there when ERCI was just search and rescue team. And then whenever we got a new task or, or got a new project and, and uh, new ideas. So, you know, when you were like there for a long time, but you learn how to do it, you make sure to teach for who comes after or to tell them. So that's why I was aware in all our activities, but I wasn't doing all of them. I was basically just jumping around wherever I'm needed. I just go. Um, we had a, a hygiene program uh, in Karatepe, the other camp. So I was taking care of that. Like basically we had 10 washing machines. So I took care of that for like a year or so. And then I moved and worked in- Sarah's being modest. She, she fundraised, organized and basically yeah. ran the entire washing machine operation before before Sarah was at that camp, there was literally no cleaning clothes. Yeah. And then we, um, and then we, uh, I moved to the, to the clinic in Moria and I was doing like, um, what do you call it? What we used to call it crowd control, basically that just making sure people do not get angry waiting for the doctor. And that's something also Sean done at, at uh, the last couple of months there which is something pretty difficult actually to do um yeah and i oh and i was doing i was doing um i was a kind of ambassador because i travel and i was doing my own talks anyway when i was in lesbos so and somehow i was speaking about i was i know actually it wasn't somehow i should have spoke about um um erci all the time because it's part of my own story circle so that's why i um yeah, I, I spoke about it and uh, and then I somehow I just brought funding in. So that's, that's it wasn't my task. It was just what I was doing there. Sarah, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to say that Sarah already kind of mentioned this, but I think it's a really important point to, to really drive home is that it seems from looking in that what, what we often get criticized for is, well, all the search and nurse organizations or all the charities, they go there and they're just trying to, displace what the authorities do and then doing so they're actually making the they're actually making it more difficult for the authorities and what I want to really make that point is that the reason that ERCI expanded in the way that it did from search and rescue to also providing a clinic is not because it wanted to gain more ground it's because 
there was no clinic functioning. It's because people literally had to clean their clothes with their hands because people literally had scabies and other skin diseases until they could have those basic services. I think in the ideal world, I think any, any fair volunteer or any fair charity organization would agree that they're filling gaps that they wouldn't want to. In the ideal world, we would not exist. And in a better world that is better than ours, there might still be a need for charitable services, but the authorities would be running them, but they aren't. And so we're kind of living in the, in the necessity of it, not in the, in the desire of it. Yes, that was uh, also going to be one of my questions. Uh, if there was any uh, sort of state response on the island, and and you also told me that this is a, this is a even worse today, is it? Because there are fewer uh, NGOs in place. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I think I think that's how I understand, at least in in search and rescue. And Sarah can speak more eloquently on the on the camp experience. But for example. A part of the, so Sarah, I'm sure you mentioned this already, but Sarah and I are being um, charged with a number of very serious felonies, including spying and assisting illegal entry, money laundering, fraud, and we face decades in prison. And the reason that that these that these charges are being brought against us is not because there's any evidence. There 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 really isn't, and we've had so much support from organisations like Human Rights Watch, for example, that said this is really the criminalization of saving lives, there is no evidence. Then why are we experiencing these, these charges? And if you, if you step back and if you look across Europe, Sarah and I are not that special. That is what's so important to realize is that Sarah and I did nothing that, that great or that, that remarkable. There are so many, there's about 171 other individuals across the European Union who have been prosecuted. That's not to mention the intimidation and the countless other small, infringements upon people's charitable work there this is such a pervasive problem across the union the question is why is it happening then and i think the reason that sarah and i have been have been prosecuted is because there is this idea that we need to stop charities from operating there's this notion that if you have search and rescue what you actually do is you create more need for people to seek asylum or you make you make more people seek asylum the idea being is that the easier that crossing is, the more people will make that journey. And so we need to make that said in, a, in its darker sense, the worse we can make that journey, the fewer people will make that crossing. So it's all about, again, stopping people making it into European borders. And if you accept that logic, then our prosecutions make sense. If you can have a chill factor on the island by scaring people, by having these incredibly expensive, incredibly lengthy, incredibly frightening prosecutions, and you can dissuade people from participating in search and rescue. So where we were, <clears throat> about four organizations doing search and rescue on the southern shore of Lesbos, today there are no civilian search and rescue organizations. I should add that civilian search and rescue organizations like ourselves, we had a seven minute response time to anywhere along that stretch of beach. The authorities have about 40 minutes to an hour. Those, those, those minutes are crucial in a context where somebody's in distress. And I want to really make that point because people think, oh, that makes sense. The, the pull factor, the easier you make that journey, the more people will pass through the water. Maybe search and rescue is a bad thing in the long term. It's a very common thing to hear. In fact, if you look at any of the available data, there is no relationship between the amount of search and rescue you have in the water and the amount of people passing through that water. There just isn't a relationship. You can see that a far more a far more likely determinant of who will make a crossing and when is not search and rescue, but the kind of weather that they experience. And that's because there's so few actual search and rescues in the water and the reasons for leaving Libya or Turkey are so severe that you would often take that journey in any case. In fact, there's only one correlation between search and rescue and the people traveling through the water. And this is really, really obvious. The more search and rescue you have, the fewer people end up drowning. So what we see when the authorities put these prosecutions into place, these many prosecutions across the European Union, all they are achieving is causing more deaths at sea. They're not solving any fundamental problem. Would you like to comment on that as well, Sarah? What? Now let's go back to the allegations against you. And um, you, were bo you both joined a Greek organization, 
you can tell us perhaps a little bit about that organization. Um, but also, um, my question was, of course, you uh, is that um, when you arrived back to Lesbos, in your case, Sarah, and you're for the first time, um, were you, how were you greeted by the population there? Uh, uh, you mentioned, that because I, I, um, I think I said something that you will return and then you were in a safe space because you were a volunteer and not a refugee, Sarah, and you told me, you said, we were not in a safe space because you were attacked as volunteers. Is this, is this something common uh, for that um, volunteers are being attacked or in other ways, Sort of, mm -hmm. um, targeted um, and um, and also if you could tell us a little bit then after that um, about the organization that you joined. Um, so um, just to refresh the, the idea, I think it's just made a little bit. Um, I was an attack myself, and none of my team members were, uh, but we were taking like extra. Um, uh, uh, care where we're there and who got uh, attacked actually is like it's uh, last year that's last year it's this year for God's sake uh, this 2020 is just one of the longest years in my life and all of us that so you don't even know if it's the same year or not anymore um yeah it's happened earlier this year that there was uh, a lot of volunteers were attacked by locals um and and one of our friends me and sean but she she's not working with our team anymore now like because we do not exist uh she was working for a medical team and she had to hide for the because people literally wanted to to uh, beat them attack them i don't know what what they wanted to do with them um and that organization that we worked for um we mentioned earlier through our activities so basically it's the same that we do session rescue um uh swimming and trainings and then we had kids activities, we had clinic, and we had that washing machine program that we installed in one of the camps. Um, and we did some also like, um, we participated in some uh, European conferences uh, through me or through others to be just involved and up, the, up to date about everything. Um, and Les was the first couple, like first year I was there and there was not really much, like I wasn't really, uh, that wasn't scary. There was nothing to to worry about. But sometimes uh, we could not be, we were not able to wear our own team T-shirts in the in the city because we need to take care of it because it's the rise of the fascist is there. Like so, it's kind of it comes in a wave. Sometimes there is, sometimes not. But personally, I was never attacked uh, in Lesbos uh, myself, and I never happened in front of me. Uh, but I knew that we always have to be careful about the situation. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think it's, it's as Sarah says, I think because of we saw these recent riots and the clash between um, the asylum seekers and the police and then the locals or the non-local population that seems to come to the island or seem to have come to the island. Um, for disruptive reasons um, at the beginning and then the middle of this year, as I'm sure you're aware. I think we're very quick then to say that, we're quick to point and say, look at these racists, what they're doing. Um, and we, we build this dichotomy. And the, often we, we view the, the volunteer and the asylum seeker as the victim and then the, the evil state or the, or the evil fascist or something. And I think, I think that that's a little bit too easy and a little bit too cliche. And I think it's a bit more complex than that. I think, I think to, to be fair, Lesbos, for example, has its own experience of population exchange in the hundred years prior, Turkey and, and Greek Lesbos, they exchanged populations. And that was a traumatic event. And so when the so-called migration crisis first um, first took place or first began, the lesbians were extremely hospitable to um, to asylum seekers and they were helpful and they wanted to be helpful. And I think, you know, they rightly were recognized internationally as being just so. Um, but if you, if you then fast forward and it's been years with not insufficient help from the Athens central government, and if Athens central government gets insufficient help from the European Union, and if we're constantly met with this barrage of talk about how 
asylum seekers or undeserving economic migrants around how volunteers are only are secretly smugglers and if you constantly hear this kind of narrative which is really actually quite pervasive not only on the greek island but in general in europe then you can see how people's mood begins to shift and so i, I think it's understandable why people are frustrated and it that does never excuses violence against asylum seekers or anyone for that matter but at least we can understand where it comes from and so i think the solution to this problem is not to point fingers, as Professor and I try to point out all the time, but to try and build some kind of dialogue and to try and build some kind of constructive policy. And that's exactly as Sarah has said she does at conferences and how both of us have been using the platform that we've gotten and that we were grateful for um, since then. Um, well, you, you can talk, perhaps say a few words about the organizations, why we talk about the allegations against you. So what happened? Um, uh, uh, sort of how were you um were you just apprehended um i know I, I think you were apprehended on your way to the airport sarah and what happened to you sean and uh did you at, at all expect this to happen to you can you tell us a little bit about those days from this sort of um when you found out that you were being probably charged with crimes such as uh, um smuggling, smuggling people and every, and uh, fraud and uh um money laundering i think as well um, tell us a little bit about that. What happened? Um, uh, yeah. Um, so basically, I was in the airport. I was going back to Berlin, um, which actually three days ago we were free. Two years ago. Um, oh. Yeah, it was literally three days ago. Uh, and actually, today is the day when I came back to Berlin because it's Human Rights Day today, and I was back in my university today. Um, so basically, um, yeah, I was in the airport flying back to Berlin and when police officers came through and they said that they want to ask me a couple of questions uh, and take me to the station and then I will, without showing me anything, without telling me anything, um, uh, they actually showed me paper in Greek, but I of course understood nothing out of it. And they said, we'll just ask a couple of questions and then you go back to Berlin, same day. Um, and then I asked my friend who was with me to call um, uh, to call actually my team because if we never called them, they would think I'm already in Berlin. And then that coordinator sent Sean to, uh, Sean was on his way to the shift in the in Moria clinic when he came to me and he can speak more about how it's been for him. Um, we didn't understand what was going on, so we were handcuffed for each other, like with each other. So we realized that, like, sorry, what the fuck is going on? You know why we are getting handcuffed? We went to the courthouse, and uh, we were questioned, and for a period of time, and then we were told that we'll be accused of these charges, and we are gonna stay on hold in prison until uh, the trial. So this is, we were not expecting because it makes no sense. And the charges that we been hearing them is just unbelievable. You know, we're like having one of the heaviest charges that anyone could have. And what, what were you doing? Volunteering? And what Sean said earlier, giving water blankets, translating. I didn't know that I would be criminalized for just translating. So, um, so yeah, of course it wasn't expected and still not expected. Uh, and we're still kind of trying to somehow put it into our everyday system life. Uh, it's been two years and we're still waiting and waiting and waiting. And I don't know when this will be over, but I hope pretty soon because we um, deserve to live without having 25 years hanging on top of our head. And I'm 25 and Sean is 26. And when it's happened, we were only 23 and 24 so yeah so like we deserve to also have a normal life like everyone and a normal life without worrying about fundraising or getting money for the next case or going to the um the greek um uh, embassy in berlin or in dublin so we can do a paper contacting our lawyer every month our lawyers every month to check if everything's okay or you know what i mean like so it's not about only what happened there and it's not about only living um, 
in a prison for three and a half months is about that actually we are still living it and people completely forgot that we are still going through this uh, in one way or another but we're but um, yeah so this is the whole situation John would you tell us your experiences <laughs> um not not much to add to that I, I suppose I suppose it, it it kind of happened out of the blue it's it, it's as Sarah says but um, but the, the first interaction we had with the police was actually the first time that Sarah and I did something called a spotting shift together so in many ways it was odd um Sarah and I were out at um, out at the kind of if you if you imagine Lesbos as an island with a with a peninsula at the southern eastern point, there's a last point on that peninsula where it is safe for a boat to land. And so we take that position every night we had done for over two years uh, to have at least two people there with communications devices that they can look out and then respond to a boat or alert the medical team if there's an issue. And on that night between midnight and 7 a.m., Sarah and I were taking that shift. It so happens that around 3 a.m. the police came by, which is fairly normal. They do these patrols, and then they ask for our passports, which again is fairly normal level of inquiry that the police have with any volunteer. So we give them our our passports, and then they then they allege that we are driving a a a a, a military car that we that somehow we have access to this military car, and it's patently untrue because our our Jeep is everywhere, has the branding of the organization very, very clearly. And so they take us in for questioning at the police, um, at the Port Authority Marina. And we're detained there. The following day, we're released without having any information. We were kept in a little cell together. We had no information on what was going on. This is about three or four months before our, the arrest that Sarah spoke about. And then a few days later, there was this article written in the local, in the local um, newspaper, and it said something, and I'm paraphrasing, um, two spies apprehended in a stolen military jeep. Um, they were trying to gain access to the secret military bases to undermine Greek sovereignty. Um, if it sounds like a James Bond novel, it is because it is like a James Bond novel. It's written this incredibly rhetorical and ridiculous um, with this ridiculous frame and we heard nothing more from it and in fact the people that arrested us we worked with them for the next few months working hand in hand to make sure that everything was okay with the asylum seekers that we assisted and then as Sarah said it happened and so now we face these charges and I can more or less rattle them off for you it's it's not quite smuggling it's assisting illegal entry which is if there is human trafficking then there's smuggling then there's assisting illegal entry um, money laundering fraud, being part of a criminal organization. My personal favorite, of course, is espionage or spying. It fulfills a childhood dream of mine, but not in the way that I'd hoped. Um, and, and these are severe, really severe crimes. And that is why we were kept in pretrial detention for three and a half months, because the idea was that they were so severe. If we did these things, then we could clearly evade justice and, and run away. Um, and to give you just a, just a quick example of what we're actually of how what we're facing is not at all what our actions were. I'm being charged, for example, um, with facilitating illegal entry. And the reason that they say I did that is because I failed to contact the local, the, the authorities, the authorities, the European authorities, when there was a boat in distress, which they say I needed to do, otherwise I'm committing a crime. And as evidence, they had taken all the information from the cell tower the tower through which my mobile phone traffic transmits to the satellite. And so they accessed all that cell tower data and they looked for my phone and they saw that at like 2 a.m. on one night, I made a, I placed a call to 112 and they say, aha, see Sean, at this time at 2 a.m. you interacted with an asylum seeker boat and you didn't call the authorities. We know there was a boat because you called 112 and you wouldn't have called that number unless there was an emergency which is absolutely true. The issue is the prosecutor then asked me, so, so why did you call 112? Why did you call the local? Why did you call the European authorities? What they didn't realize or what they pretended not to realize is that 112 is literally the European emergency response number. It is the number you call to contact 
the emergency services. And so when I said that, they were like, oh, okay, that, that's confusing. But an even more interesting fact is that 15 seconds before I placed the 112 call, you can very clearly see from the same data that they presented to accuse us that I placed the call to local Coast Guard right there in plain, the exact number that they that I would call to call my accusers, actually. And so it is abundantly clear that out of all these charges that we face, on every count or instant case, there is no evidence of wrongdoing. In fact, there's only evidence of cooperation. You have to ask them, why is it happening? And again, it's, it's not just us. It is this wider structural logic that the worse and the more dangerous you can make search and rescue, the fewer people will end up doing it. I will just say to all the attendees that attendants uh, that if you have any questions to Sean and Sarah, please uh, write them in the Q and A, and we'll um, take them up and ask them. Uh, yes, um, I'll just wanted to say that the uh, organization you were working for was the Greek Emergency Response uh, Coordination Center, right? right? The uh, Erki. Okay. Uh, has, can you say if you have? Uh, is that organization being um, sort of blacklisted in Greece or is it, is it still functioning? It doesn't exist. Its accounts were frozen. Um, its management were all investigated um, to no avail. But of course, now it is impossible for it to continue. And I, I would add that, for example, Drop in the Ocean, which is a Norwegian organization that also did search and rescue, or that assisted in parts of search and rescue operations. They didn't quite do search and rescue. Um, they also don't assist in that area anymore, along with the many others. Um, how, how has the time been? Because um, since you so at least were released, I think on bail, both of you, uh, and your time back in Ireland and in Germany, um, has the, the, have the charges in somehow affected your lives? Um, in, in, in what ways, I would say, because I assume they have. <laughs> um, they didn't for me, and I'm very lucky because I'm the famous refugee. Mm. So it just added more action into my life story, so it made it cooler. Um, but on the mental health scale, still suffering till today, you know, um, just is not super easy to... Um, you're out with your friend having coffee and then you receive an email um, from your lawyer that's one, two, three, you have to do. And you're like, you know, basically, I don't know. I'm not going to say what I will feel. It just, I think that attendance and everybody is here. Just imagine how, um, how, how uh, disturbing it is. But who suffered is actually Sean and, and other colleagues because the other colleagues, um, they're all Greek and they, and two of them have a travel restriction and they cannot leave Greece. And took them, one of them found a job, but the other, I don't know what status he is in. Uh, and for Sean, he, he took years and like to find jobs and apply for jobs. And he was not um, accepted because of his criminal, uh, I don't want to say background, but the situation that is going. <laughs> So uh, I wasn't, I was, I was framed as a hero um, and which is unfair because I, again, we didn't do any heroism uh, actions. I, that was my passion and I was doing it and I will do it again and again and again, the same places till I'm, I'm passionate about it anymore. So yeah, not for me, it's for Sean. Sean who was uh, heavily affected by that. Yeah, I, I think to some extent that that's that's true. I, um, personally, it's it's been hard just to move on with my life because it was never my intention to stay in this sphere, and um, it's just been been difficult to to meet some of the the accusations from people who say that oh, you're a criminal and X, Y, and Z, and what you did was horrendous. Um, but also just practically that, you know, you have to declare all of all of these things. You have to declare these things to job applications, to, to anything that you do. Um, for example, I am, um, along with my 
alongside my general work, I have um, I'm doing a, a law degree in 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 the UK. Now I'm not sure if I can actually stay in the UK because I have to clear um, such investigations. Um, and with Brexit looming, that um, there's a there's an element of discretion now that that wasn't there before, which risks which risks my studies, which is all a bit um, difficult, I suppose. But again, it's it's hardly a complaint given the given the given how much worse it is for other people. And I think it's so common to focus on, and Sarah's exempt from this because Sarah has experienced both sides and she's involved in a much more intimate way than I am. But it's so, so common for people to focus on the rescuer rather than the people who are surviving and who often survive without any rescuer. Um, and so even, even in our hardship, we have a place of privilege, which again is it's difficult. And, you know, I, I I hope that we've used that we've used that well. Um, so since since being released, I've done a lot of work um, at the European Union level. Um, I've I was invited to be a civilian expert to the to the um, Directorate General. So the European Commission has a DG Home. DG Home is the body responsible for all the eternal European policies or for the kind of security policies. Um, and they invited me to, to speak on the experience of counter smuggling and how that wasn't constructive. And so we've, we've worked with a number of um, academics and policy experts to try and, and shift some of those policies towards a more human rights centric approach. Um, I've been in the United States at the, at the Senate lobbying for the same thing. And so I've had, I've had these amazing experiences and these very, I hope, useful experiences um, so I really can't say that I have suffered so much, but it has it has been difficult on on some level as well. Well, yes, you have this threat tank sort of hanging over your heads all the time, and you don't know it's like being you don't know if there will be formal charges or if you will have to go to, to Greece or if there will be. But as long as they're there, you are a little bit inhibited to do the work you want to do. I, I'm assuming, um, if because there are actually no questions from, from the audience. Um, if you were to say a few words, uh, send a message to the states in Europe, um, what would that be uh, in relation to, of course, the, the situation on, on the Mediterranean and, and, and also the charges brought against um, uh, volunteer workers? Oh, there is actually a important question. Um... That's basically they're asking when is the trial date, which we do not have one yet. That's the one of the biggest uh, um, issues that we're going through that we don't know when. Um, and the second one is, thank you for your inspiring stories. Can you recommend help organizations to support for their work, both financially and with manpower, sorry. Yeah. So um, um, I would recommend. Answer. I would recommend Choose Love that is still existing on Lesbos right now, and um, Choose Love is basically uh, um, a London-based uh, organization that is known for being the first online uh, refugee refugee shop where they sell. Um, Basically, uh, excuse me, sorry. Do you want, do you want me to yes, take? Yes, 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 please. Um, I, Choose Love is, is, really, is really fantastic. Um, I, I think that sometimes we have this view though, and maybe I'm being overly cynical, that we need to go somewhere else or need to help a far flung organization to be, to truly be seen or to be useful. And I think that that often blinds us to the opportunities or to the needs within our own country. And so I would say that probably the best, probably the best thing to do, Ida, would be to look at to look at what what the needs are in Sweden. And I, and as from my understanding, there, there there are there are a few. And to try and to try and not not necessarily support something, and obviously you can, but to always look at, at, at local needs as well. I think I think this is something as 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 every European member state is in some way involved in in these cases. For example, there's there's so many cases in Denmark. There's there's a few in the UK, and there are quite a few in France and in Germany. 
they don't get as much attention and the 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 human rights issues don't get as much attention in the non-borderline member states and so so looking at looking at those needs and looking and helping in your own community i think is, is hugely valuable one of the biggest obstacles to better policy changes in europe seems to me that seems to me that my neighbors for example don't agree with my policy decisions or don't agree that they might believe that every asylum seeker is only stealing jobs or might be a terrorist which is not an uncommon thing to hear and so from my, from my point of view, having conversations with my neighbors has been one of the most constructive things I can do. And it's also one of the easiest things that I can do. So it need necessarily be an organization or this far flung place where the, where the needs are visually very severe, but it, it could be here in our neighborhood. So because we have to um, finish off right now. So if, did you have any, would you like to say if you, something to the European states to Sweden, for example, to European Union, what would that be? Um, not to Sweden in particular. I think to the European Union is basically stop normalizing migration issues and stop calling it migrant crisis because it's not. Uh, we did not bring the crisis. Uh, the crisis existed because of the EU from the first place in our own countries. I think um, we all need to be taken responsibility for what was going on in the Middle East for years or in so many countries that has been going through war or other things like I know a lot of people would not say that but you know um, one of the resource for weapons in Syria is Germany um, and many other countries are involved heavily involved in what's going on in in the Middle East um, I would ask to people to stop normalizing what's going on in the Middle East or or in the war zones like Afghanistan or like uh, Africa because we are as human as everyone else is and we deserve to live as normal as everyone else is and we are not creating the situation that we are living in um, and um, that we have to put the migrant uh, issues on the priorities on the table because it's been years and we are actually losing people lives over um, um, over that we think that it's just not important and it could wait. Um, uh, we are equal and we live by uplifting each other. If we are a, a, an American president or a Syrian refugee, we're all the same. And then I think we all should just start treating each other the same. Uh, because if we continue to do that to ourselves, we're gonna face the consequences. And we all know we have um, uh, climate refugees in a couple of years which is gonna be a whole, let's call it, it's gonna be called migrants crisis, um, which unfortunately we did not yet deal with the one we have right now. So where are we gonna take the people that are coming later, which we know about since years. And I mean, and we Sweden have the greatest climate activist, Greta, and I think everybody is pretty aware of what's gonna go next. So I think to, my main and only message is to stop normalizing um, migrants, the crisis, and what's going on in the war zones and Middle East, because we, I think we have lived, lived enough of that. And COVID-19 was the biggest example of, of how uh, we could all live. And for me, it wasn't a problem that I'm sitting at home for a couple of months and not traveling because this is how I lived my, almost my whole life in Syria. I was not allowed to travel. And um, the idea of you wait in the line for hours to get into the supermarket, you're not allowed to hug your loved ones, you're not allowed to see your loved ones. This is how we are living. Um, so I'm not comparing, but comparing um, to, to check our privileges and check what we are, where we are standing and start giving back to those who need it because not everybody is going back to their office at the end of COVID-19 and all their life will be back to normal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Sean will have to um, save your answer, I think, yeah, uh, because you have to, to finish now. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us today and uh, congratulations to the prize and we'll do our best to bring attention to uh, all the work you do, but in particular also the situation in the Mediterranean. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah Madini and, and Sean Binder. Uh, thank you.